Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WrestleNomics. Uh, we are joined today not only by our occasional Brock Lesnar-like co-host, Jesse Collings, but also we have a special guest today, uh, John Carlin, who formerly worked with, with WWE, but has a lot of experience uh, with the WWE Network and with acquiring library. So we're really excited to talk to John today. How you do, how you doing, John? Hello, all. Uh, doing great. Uh, I appreciate it, Brandon, very much. Uh, obviously, you and I have been uh, friendly, I guess, friends. Uh, are we friends? I guess we are. Uh, for the better part of the last year or so, I would say, right? Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Yeah, yeah so uh, I'm ready to go whenever you guys are, and you uh, hopefully I can help out and, and bring some, some great information and uh, you know, like you said, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm there nearly, I was on year 23 uh, before I left uh, uh, WWE, and uh, I'm ready to go when, whenever you got, whatever you guys got, I'm, I'm fire away. So I guess for the listeners at home or the viewers at home, can you just kind of describe briefly um, how you came to WWE and what kind of your role was uh, when you were working for the company? Like you said, you had a few different roles over 23 sure. years, but kind of describe yeah. briefly what you did um, while you were working for WWE. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, I start, before WWE, so I was at ESPN at the time uh, in 1998. So I finished, uh, you know, just kind of, I was just a kid, you know, was, uh, you know 20 something and ended up uh, poking around a little bit you know, looking for jobs and, and, you know, WWE just happened to, to, to be one of them. And, and at the time, you know, we were, my wife and I, we were, we're not, we're not married. So I'm, I'm trying very hard to obviously make a good living and commuting. You know, I, we lived in Stanford at the time we were commuting to Bristol in Connecticut and um, it was, you know, it was a haul, you know, so it was, it was tough and, and, and it wasn't for a lot of pay and there wasn't, you know, a lot of, we didn't have coverage, you know, there was no insurance. So WWE, the headquarters, you know, being in Stanford, as well as the television studio, was uh, right around the corner, uh, directly, more or less across the street from, from where our apartment was at the time. The pay was better, and the benefits were all there, and it was, you know, kind of a no-brainer. So, you know, and I've always been a wrestling guy, you know, I, I've always loved the product, grew up on it, as a lot of us did, uh, you know, in the Hogan, uh, in the Hogan years, uh, certainly. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I signed on there in February of 1998. Uh, like you said, obviously, a lot of different roles in that in, a, in, a, in, a, in all of those years. But I think the main the main thing here, you know, for for the audience and, and for, for what you guys might be looking for is is, you know, the, the latter stuff. Yes, I did everything as a producer, you know, associate producer, supervising producer, whether it be, you know, produce the I produced some of our syndicated shows for a while. I worked on long form, short, short form, form documentaries uh, in the home video department. Uh, I, I did live shoots. I, I worked on the road for a while, uh, stage managing. Uh, that's working with the announce team. I'm, I was that that dorky dude that sits with the announcers. I was that guy, and uh, also stage managed, which is doing a lot of the backstage stuff with the talent. Uh, certainly went all around the country and all around the world doing shoots with talent. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. So th there's not a lot I didn't, I haven't done in the business, uh, you know, in the wrestling business and the TV business uh, combined. Uh, but but like I said, the, the majority of, of the stuff that, that I think is, is good for the topic here is certainly, you know, the latter years, which was working first for uh, when we first started, or when WWE first started the uh, SVOD service. You know, that was kind of pre-streaming, pre pre-Netflix, you know, pre that kind of thing. So uh, the, that was uh, started back up in 2004. And I kind of was part of the team that headed up that that group. And uh, what we did at that time was go out and uh, I, I was lucky enough and, and, and privileged enough to be to start acquiring some of these libraries. Right. And what we talk about the libraries and I mean video libraries, all the the footage that you see on 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 currently you know on the network now or or for some of those documentaries biographies whatever you want to call them uh certainly guys had history in other companies a lot of guys and gals had history you know coming up through the business and other in other companies certainly so we at, at wwe you know we wanted to have 
a lot of that in 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 you know to be able to provide the viewer our audience the wwe universe with with the best possible content we wanted to make sure we got our hands on that so i was appointed from the production team to kind of be that guy to go out there to go you know to dallas uh for the world-class championship wrestling assessment uh to go to uh calgary to assess the stampede library with the hart family you know that kind of thing uh which was great you know and, and like i said it was, it was a privilege and I, I would the company trusted me and you know i would certainly come back write up a report give it to the powers that be and then you know they would ultimately make the decision for whatever the price was if it was worth it so my job was to go there and you know check things out whether it be the quality of the of the actual videotapes themselves uh to you know uh, the actual physical tapes to the quality of them when they're up you know what did they look like how's the audio how's the video and and, and then of course to to uh give them an out uh, give them an, a, a a talent assessment you know what was the talent like do we have a plus talent do we just have b talent you know is it worth a million dollars that they're charging us for this those kinds of things so i was able to do that again all over the country and, and in canada as well uh to kind so of bring that to the table at this stage we're talking about well before wwe we're talking the wwe classics on demand or wwe 24 7. i feel like they were called both of those things they were they were indeed you were correct jesse uh definitely. at the time yep yep i i, I, I and, was there i was there for both of those year yep we started with 24 7 and evolved into classics mm -hmm. and then, so this was kind of like you said pre-netflix pre-real like traditional what we would consider now like your standard ott service this was yeah. an on-demand service pluses, i remember your, Param your paramount pluses all that stuff none of that stuff existed obviously back in 2004. right but on demand and dvr and the ability to to watch things on demand kind of without having to tape something or um have tivo or anything like that was becoming a, a kind of a big deal and wwe was kind of you know with a lot of other entertainment companies looking to see what you can do with this kind of technology which is what can, can people watch our product on using their cable subscription when we're not on television um and yeah, exactly. wwe has this video library so when you first started looking for it obviously you have wwe's own archives by this is what 2004 obviously this always going to have that it's the same company you would have had wcw you yeah. would have had ecw were there other archives that the company already had through various previous purchases how much of the kind of like territorial content library would you say you had before you were kind of started out on this mission you know going to dallas and going to calgary uh yeah like you said so there was definitely i'm trying to recall um so ECW, obviously, so with the WCW and the ECW stuff, um, that was that was a package deal, right? I didn't have to go on the, on those missions um, only because um, that stuff, again, this is prior, like you said, it, those acquisitions were prior to this venture, this SVOD venture, but I probably would have been part of it anyway if that was the case. But they, obviously, we, you know, WWE bought both of those companies, right? bought out both of those companies basically so the assets came with you know so that's definitely those two would qualify and, and and wcw was interesting because you know there's a lot of history there so it wasn't just your your you know your your, your nitro thunder era or your you know wcw saturday night era it was all the jcp and but and for those of you that don't know jim crockett productions uh, which was bought out by turner and turned into WCW, a um, little history lesson, I guess. But um, so that stuff went so many years back and came with so many different things, which was fascinating because that came with your Mid-Atlantic. That came with stuff that I actually discovered on the back end of a lot of these uh, reels, which was uh, GCW, Georgia Championship Wrestling, right? So that that stuff all came with Jim Crockett Productions. So that was a that was a big history a big hall of, of wrestling history, which, you know, was fascinating for guys like me who, who, who are into that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it, it sounds very fascinating because anyone that was a, a wrestling fan, I'm actually too young to really have done this, but people who are a generation older than me, obviously 
tape trading or going to yard sales or going to video stores and seeing what people have going through a box of videotapes and being like, Oh, look at this. I look what I found. It's, you know, 1986, you know, yeah. Jim Crockett pr promotions, yeah. you know, whatever you're doing that. But on this ridiculously, it sounds like you're doing that, but like on this massive scale where you're going to like yeah. the actual whole video libraries and yeah. going through this treasure trove of, of tape trading and tape researching, but you're doing it at like a massive, almost incomprehensible right, scale right, right. To, and that, to people. And, that, and that's great. You know, that's, it's, a, it's a thrill. And then, and then getting to, 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 uh, let, let me just finish that other point. So the other one that stands out is the, is the AWA, right? The American wrestling association. So, uh, and that, again, for those of you out there that don't know, that was owned by Vern Gagne. Um, and Vern, um, Vern was tough, you know, Vern, uh, I was a kind of, I was involved in that, but not as involved as I would become later on. Um, that was a, that was a tough haul. I mean, that was all, you know, a lot of history there too, because some of that stuff went back to this. We would have miscellaneous reels that went all the way back to like, we got it. We have a, again, we, I say we, WWE um, had, we had a, if I remember correctly, I believe we had a, a, an old killer uh, Kowalski match from like 1961 that we, we found an old AWA taping, like of a television taping from like 1961. If I if I'm if I'm remembering that right, uh, you know, which was uh, you know when you're a history guy and, and you know you just want to get that kind of stuff on the air, especially if you're doing a piece on 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 Walter, you know, killer, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Those are gems. You know, we, we, uh, we had a thing called hidden gems for a while and, and a lot of that stuff, you know, fell in, into that category. Uh, <clears throat> but as, as, as you know, these libraries came in, the, the thing that my job was, was to try to figure out creative ways, you know, in the team, to be fair, um, team around me and, and our group, you know, it was to figure out ways to make these things cool again, right? Or you know, obviously we want to we're, we're 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 catering to the history fan, to the fan who's looking for this, you know. And there are a lot of them out there because we would hear from them a lot on on some of these websites, uh, certainly. Uh, just uh, how do we how do we how do we turn it? How do we put it on the air to make it cool again? Make it attractive to all wrestling fans, you know, whether it would be to get a host in and, and, and do wraparounds or whether it be to, to change the look or to improve something here and there, you know, and there were challenges with that because, you know, one of the main challenges I had on a daily basis, and this morphed into, you know, when we, when we morphed into network use too, you know, it was the, the copyrighted music is a major, major issue. Okay. That, that, that costs the company a lot of money. If, if those things slip through the cracks and, and one of my main jobs, uh, you know, for our group. And then later uh, it, it became company wide. I was kind of the go-to guy company wide for any, any issues or, you know, I, I kind of became a liaison between production and legal. So I was on the phone constantly with the lawyer, with the, with the music lawyers, as well as the regular lawyers, you know, cause there were other issues with likenesses or folks or, when you bought some of these libraries, you know, back then there were handshake agreements with these old promoters, you know, the handshake agreement in the 2000s and the 2000, you know, 20s, you know, that's not okay, you know, for, for, for a billion dollar company like WWE, you know, we got to play by the rules, you know, things have to be right or else we end up, WWE again, ends up losing on, on the losing side financially. And that's, you know, that was kind of my, I was kind of a watchdog for that. Again, another important role that I embraced and, and obviously was very proud of, you know, so that was that was a big deal. You know, I had, you know, and again, now I became the guy the entire company looked to for this kind of stuff, you know, so I, I had, you know, I had spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet with, you know, I, I you know, I would, again, the team, I don't want to take anything away from the team. They were certainly involved up to their necks in this as well. Uh, but but just, you know, having a hand in picking out all the brand new music. And then figuring out creative ways to get it into the program and i'm talking about music that was either in an open in a package in a, a package as a feature right or you know the closing portion of the program or uh, uh, uh obviously uh ring uh, you know announce uh sorry uh ring entrances right that was that's a big deal that those were big 
So a lot of the, a lot of times you'd run into some of these older companies uh, that would just roll out whatever the whatever the hit was of the day to their biggest star. You know, if if you know in the in the mid in you know in the, in the mid south area, for instance, you know, uh, you know, junkyard dog, you know, used to come down to a, a, you know a popular queen, uh, you know, hit right. Another one bites the dust, right? And they didn't care because it fit JYD and that's what they went with and it was popular and so be it, you know, but we had to, we had to address that kind of thing, you know, so that was either rebuilding the entire entrance with a new piece of music, trying to save the announce if possible. Sometimes we got lucky, you know, with the ECW library, for instance, you know, Joey Styles, the, the main play by play gear guy there for, as most of you know, um, he was, uh, they always had a clean channel. And what I what I mean by that is on one of the channels, channel one used to be just Joey, no crowd, no music that saved our behinds on numerous occasions because ECW was the biggest violator of this, no matter what, because you know how Paul Heyman operated and that was the end of the lot, whatever he didn't care. You know, that's how they that's how they got their their freaking reputation in the first place. So that luckily. You know, we got hundreds of hours of ECW shows on the air that we probably would not have been able to or would have struggled for hours upon hours trying to figure out how to make that happen and make it presentable. You know, that's the key. We always had to make stuff presentable. We're not going to put a product on the air that's half halfway done, right? That's not how we it has no it. audio, right? Has, has no or, or it's choppy or, you know, some of the times we had to put the put the if, if we couldn't lose the music and we didn't have a clean track of the of the play by play guys wcw had some of that too frequently so that was also helpful um we would we would we we would just take the new piece of music and what we would call bury the old music so this, again we did a lot of the editing on our own and that was another great part of of being a wwe you got so much experience as not only a producer but an editor as well but some of the stuff was just too too complicated that's why we actually had real editors that that was what they were paid for so we would take harder projects to them and just do the best you could you know so we would have to bury the old music so we'd lower that you know to a point and then maybe dump a little bit of new crowd on top so the crowd still kind of existed uh you know we're trying to keep it as authentic as possible uh but you know, and then slide a little bit of the announcers up and down here and there, maybe for some just important parts of, you know, introducing the character or or or, or making the announcement of who, who he or she would be facing, whatever we thought was uh, as important, you know, important enough to get on the air to help the product obviously not lose its integrity, you know, was important. So we try to slide maybe the announce up just a little bit and get little little quips in there without with with hearing maybe the the littlest amount of the quote real music as possible you know as possible so we so we would try we, we we obviously put in the effort to to not have any of that music ever be on the air some would like i said a beat or two here and there slid in there just to get the announcer to say a line that we needed you know we we did the best we could to get rid of it but those those were tricky, and that and that was the most difficult of, of, of that. And again, that that same thing happened when, when we morphed to the network. You know, it, it, it and, and sometimes it, it even got more complicated because then, you know, we had to deal with, uh, you know, starting like you said, the old library, all the all the WWE libraries, right? We had to go back and do start from Raw number one, you know, back in 1994 or five. You know, that that was where we started, and a lot of times. The standards and practices back then weren't all necessarily what they are today you know so those had to be all the raws all the smackdowns all well, i was going to ask were you involved in the scrubbing of the wwf logo oh that had to was take i place? ever oh was i ever <laughs> uh another another horrible part of, of of what we did there but 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 at the end of the day enjoyable uh yes of course that was right smack dab in the middle of classics so we would spend hours hours um removing you know whether it be uh, you know obviously audio <clears throat> audio wise you know you couldn't say those three letters right ww 
exactly we, we either took the whole thing out or you got what you you know most of the time we got and, and people hated it but there was nothing I, I mean our group was 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 basically the, the group that did that yes we were we were the ones who did all of that and then you know you had to get the turnbuckles right you had to put mm-hmm. the yeah turnbuckles. That, was, that was a bad in hindsight you probably wish you didn't put the logo on, no, on, on the no turnbuckles. no and and then there was various you know the rules the rules at wwe change all the time for those of you that don't know that um, it's just, it's just a quirk. It, it just the way that the, 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 the company operates. So, you know, there was a time where it was just the scratch logo. So we were good, you know, so the, so the block logo, the old the WWF, the block one, that one was okay. And then a year later it wasn't okay. So we had to go all the way back and retrack our steps and to pull all that stuff down and redo all of that. Uh, you know, whether it be the referee's jer- Jersey or the, the, you know, sometimes the logo would be on the ring mat, right? Or certainly on the skirts, right? The ring skirts mm-hmm. were a major deal. Uh, certainly up in the rafters, sometimes they would have them hanging all over the place, you know, back in the, you know, in the, in the, in the nineties, certainly. So um, you're doing like a where's Waldo where you're looking at still shots oh, and being like, Oh, there's a logo. It's up there. It's in the top left corner. It's hanging and, and from the rafters. A hundred percent. No joke. A hundred percent. You got, you hit it right on the head. And that, that was, that took up hours and hours and hours of our time. For sure, and and just just to just to to, to blur one of those. At one point, we, we just gathered like you know a dozen episodes at a time. Let's just say, and I'm I'm just making that number up, whatever it was, and you know we would have folks, PAs, you know, go through them and make sure they wrote down every single time the logo came, you know, make make logs of those things. And just because it was taking up so much of our edit time that we had to actually do to get stuff on the air, we we just gave it to editors like on the side, like either overnight or, you know, at a time where we would just have them come in and work with us for 10 hours, but not in the edit, just by themselves in some room somewhere else, just doing blurring. Blurring was a full time job. The edit staff had had folks that were just there to blur you know that's how big of a project that was for sure you talked about um copyright and worrying worrying about that aspect when it comes to editing when the transition from ww network to peacock took place there were a lot of stories about having to go back and look at contents and say is this content appropriate for a major streaming service like peacock are we going to have there's a, a lot of uh stuff that happened in wrestling history especially if you go to some of these older territories that would not be considered politically correct today um, uh, pr- wouldn't be politically correct back then but 100%. it was wrestling and it was yep. considered low brow yep w- w- was that something at all that was discussed either with you know classics on demand or network as far as keep an eye out for certain things that we can't have you know whether it's on our on demand streaming service or on our network um certainly and 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 i don't want to lie to you or to the folks out there uh the 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 peacocks uh switch the the switch over to peacock happened after my time so Mm -hmm. i i can't really speak to that directly but but what you said is basically true yes i mean because we went through that my my experience with that because i do have some is um at the beginning there was a lot of um so we had two sides to the network and um, i i i think it still operates that way now i'm not sure uh there was the linear side and the vod side right so i was basically captain of the vod side so on the vod side we can we could basically air whatever we wanted as long as we rated it appropriately so if the show was really 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 bad and i'm talking about politically incorrect uh a bloody massacre um sexuality hell nudity whatever whatever happened uh that those kinds of things you know if we had to rate the show you know um the worst possible rating that, that, we, that we had that was okay for vod anything goes on vod that was that was our that was our direction that's what we were told and that was the still the standard as far as you know if as far as i know um but 
there was there was a lot of debate at the be the early rollout in 14 15 around that time the, there was debate about the linear side so at the beginning the linear side followed kind of the same rules which was in retrospect a huge mistake i mean i think all of us that were, Real quick, you know, can you just clarify what what do you mean when you say linear side as opposed to VOD sure, side? Sure. So the VOD side, you have to have like uh, it, 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 it's a parental thing. You know, you have to have parental permission or there's codes that you have to put in or some sort of a thing that like kids can't get to it unless their parents mm -hmm. know about it. Something along those lines. The linear side was more of like your everyday TV, like you and I just going into the living room, put the TV on, you know, and flipping channels, you know, that. So like they had a they had a lineup and everything like where where like you said in, in in today's day and age we like the streaming stuff we like to stop and go we like to put on whatever we want we want to choose this episode or that episode nobody wants to like hang out and watch you know whatever you have scheduled for me on your television network from nine to five that's just not a thing but they wanted it to be that way on one side so that's the way the linear side was set up they had a schedule. It was a, a schedule for every day what was airing you know it was just like an old school tv network uh and, yeah so but, people were if people remember this would be like if you went on ww network on the app on their app and you would just see they'd be always be playing something at certain times if it was a pay-per-view yeah. on it would be a pay-per-view yeah. but sometimes you just turn it on they'd be showing you know original content or old raws or things like yeah, that exactly so the, anyway the debate like i said 2014 2015 maybe 60 i don't know how long it lasted but the, the problem was to, to have no rules on the linear side and just let that go. Like they were letting go and all of us on the other side, to be fair, we knew that that was, you know, probably not such a great idea because everybody, anybody has access, access to it, you know, and to see some of that stuff, you know, I, I, the rumors that we heard were folks over at, at the tower. And for those of you that don't know how WWE is set up, there's Titan Tower, right, which is the main corporate building, which you all can see off the exit if you travel on 95 South in Connecticut. And then there's a television studio, which is around the corner. So we worked around the corner in the television studio. So apparently, again, from what we heard, there was folks who were going up in the elevators daily at Titan Tower, high executives, and even, you know, you know, certainly some females uh and saw some some things on there that were very inappropriate and very not okay for linear and i guess a lot of people in the hierarchy were hearing about it pretty much regularly and that changed right quick so which was for the best it was for the best for the company it was for the best for the network because so, in the elevator at titan tower right there's there's monitor take, with, with w network playing on it correct 24 yeah. 7. so that's so it's how w, it's that's wwe how executives this. being surprised or, or not, yeah, any, I think it, not necessarily executive. I think it was any employees that maybe mm -hmm. felt it uncomfortable or, or felt like, wow, I'm not sure if we should be watching this at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, whatever it might've been, you know? So I, and again, that's rumor. I, I don't, we, that's what we were told or what we heard. So, so then, you know, that's when linear became to your point about the Peacock situation, linear became a very, very strict in other words, people would come to me a lot. That This was another one of my many hats that I wore. It was, and there were lots of them. So it was, um, folks would come to me through a, a colleague of mine who I worked closely with, who helped me a, a great deal in, 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 uh, in my VOD ventures there. Uh, they would often go to, go to her and and, and try to pitch these ideas that she then in turn had to go through, come to me. And I had to basically say, yes, that's okay for linear. No, hell no, that's not okay for linear. That was, you know, and, and one in particular that I, that I always use it as an example, because I just, I, I just can't understand it because it happened year after year after year. Because a lot of times on the linear side that folks wanted to use <clears throat> content that was relevant to uh, a holiday, for instance, right? Um, a Black History Month, right? Something like that. So every year, every year, I would constantly get asked the question, can we air St. Valentine's Day Massacre on the linear side? And every year, the answer was continuously, 
not a chance in hell, right? Because it's not appropriate for PG. It's not, Linear was strictly, strictly at this point, PG only, PG only, PG only. So uh, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, for those of you that don't know, was a, a old February pay-per-view back in 1999 that had, you know, blood and guts and sexuality all over the place. It was like from, from, from hour one to hour three. So like that was never going to see the line at light of day under my watch. So that was, you know, those were some of the things to, to try and give you something again, since I wasn't there for the Peacock switch over. Uh, it was a very similar situation. I know exactly what you're talking about, how strict, you know, they can be. And, and that, that same thing happened um, that I can't speak to uh, again. Another thing I just happened to think of that same thing happened with our, you know, when we were doing the shows, uh, the best of shows, if all of any of you remember those, those were the things that we were kind of doing when the pandemic first hit, when we were all sent home, because uh, we really were struggling for content. Uh, those shows then in turn would get cut down and sent over to Fox because FS1 obviously had no programming either with all sports you know, shut down. So that was another project that was very, so their, their S&P group, and that, what I mean by that is standards and practices, were, were even stricter than anything that we had to go through, through me or through any folks to get stuff on the, our linear side. <clears throat> they had an even stricter uh, group over there that they went through. And even though we had made it fully PG safe, that wasn't fully PG, PG safe sometimes in their view. So they would go through and pick apart stuff. Like uh, I remember one time, I think I got a list. I thought I was fully done with the program it was best of Ric Flair, as a matter of fact. And I thought it was done, done, shipped, ready to go. <clears throat> and like, I think the next morning I got a list of about 30 or 40 fixes that they had that like I would never have seen in a million years, you know, unless you didn't, unless you scrub the thing with a fine tooth comb, which is what they were doing, you know, which was a hassle, but it was, it was what we had to do with our partners and, and make people, you know, everybody happy and get the product on the air that they wanted. So that's what we did. So, but in, you know, that's just another example. I feel like a, a best of Ric Flair that's PG maybe just contains his entrance and that's it. Right. <laughs> well, like right. you said, like St. Valentine's Day Massacre is like kind of like a classic Attitude Era pay-per-view. Exactly. I'm assuming most of the Attitude Era content, which is I'm assuming by far the most popular retro content that was on the network. And it's certainly the most co popular retro content in the podcasting world. Um, wasn't on the linear side because basically all of it wouldn't have passed the, the test for, for being PG. Zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Not a chance. Not none of it. But but again, like, you know, we use our VOD, you know, we, we filled the VOD side with like everything that's on VOD right now or, or, a, or a good, a certainly a large, large chunk of it was done by by myself and my team, you know, uh, which, you know, at this stage of the game, the, all the ups and downs that have gone on with the with, with the pandemic and, you know, certain layoffs and, and different things of that nature is basically uh, basically doesn't exist anymore. The, the whole the whole team of us are, are basically, are, uh, unfortunately, are, I think, are are gone. Um, but but you know, it, ninety plus percent of that content was done by our group. You know, uh, it, the, the entire ECW library, the entire WCC WCCW library, the entire you know um, uh, uh, Mid South library, et cetera. All of that stuff was 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 done by our group, and, and and we're you know certainly proud of that, and took a lot of work and a lot of hours, and you know I, I just hope it was uh, something that the, the fans today can still enjoy. Can you talk about being in WWE during that time period, and kind of my question is kind of like a timeline of enthusiasm from the company side when it comes to the network, because it seemed like from the outside looking in that enthusiasm for the network kind of waxed and waned throughout its existence there were periods of time where it felt like a lot of resources were being pumped into the network and there was going to be a lot of different content that was going to be developed then six months later they'd be canceling stuff and programs that were supposed to happen or programs that did happen are gone can you kind of describe what do you feel like as an employee like what the enthusiasm internally was for the network and you felt like if you had a consistent support for the network and the idea of the network throughout its entire existence. And I guess we could have, there were a lot of different leadership changes throughout the early couple of years of the network, right? Uh, yeah, and, and still, you know, and still are. I mean, certainly that happened throughout the last couple of years as well. Um, you know, and, and we were certainly part of that, you know. Um, but 
I, I think you described it. You described it pretty accurately. Uh, you know, to be honest, it it, it, it definitely waned. Uh, there was definitely, you know, certainly a long a period of time where everybody was all in, right? And like you said, and then you know, six months later, it was you know, most most everybody was all out, you know, and we had to kind of struggle to stay relevant. Um, you know, at one point, you know, the VOD service was the main focus of everybody in the company. You know, the goal was 10,000 hours of programming. And I must have heard that line a, a, a zillion and a half times, you know, because um, I would have to go there and, and present, you know, monthly to executives and other folks, uh, you know, just what the progress was. Um, I mean, I think they wanted 10,000 hours in something like five years. And and we were pumping out so much content, we were able to get it done in three. You know, again, another proud moment that certainly that I that I still hold hold very close. And and I, I thank I thank the team, of course, for sure. Uh, but you know, after that point, you know, and that and that took a lot. You know, at one point we were doing over 250 hours of programming per month. You know, that's a lot. I mean, we had you know, I think at at our height we had. 10 folks i think all together maybe a little maybe 10 or 11 whatever it was but still you know folks are also doing other things you know so that's a lot that's a lot you know and i had to i had to work right alongside them you know i wasn't just assigning stuff i was i was working right alongside them but but to your point you know the, the vod stuff after that goal was hit uh we were lost in the shuffle to, to be to to be quite frank uh, I had to struggle to, you know, continuously try to, uh, uh, you know, stress the importance of all this. I mean, we spent millions of dollars on all this footage. You know, we should still continue to get it up. We should continue to use it. Fans still enjoy it. You know, we, we certainly, if we, if we slowed or we didn't get a, a good haul out for the month, whatever it might have been, you know, we certainly heard about it. Yeah, was it a niche group of fans for the most part? But we knew there was plenty of fans out there that, that enjoyed it and that wanted it. And, and you know, not to give it to them, you know, the, when we became, like I said, less and less relevant, you know. Uh, you know, I obviously being the, the guy who was kind of heading up that group, that didn't make me very happy, you know. But but that I think you hit it on the head. I mean, certainly, and that's not just with this. You know, I, I think that that certainly happened throughout my career there and and happened <clears throat> uh, with many different ventures that's just kind of how wwe is that's just kind of how it goes there um and it, it, you know it happened you know the more it happened it, you know the more you kind of got used to it and it just you know you you knew it was coming it was just a matter of time you know whenever it was and and sometimes that's you know that's okay sometimes that's you know just rolling with the times and and rolling with what's hot and i understand that uh you know so that you know to to their point you know that's i can understand that you know in in that particular if you think of it that way sure but but uh you know certainly that's the way it works within the company where you know it, it's in and out you know full bore one day not so much the next day that's just the way it, it what, rolls do you do you think their goals changed when the sense that maybe when the network first started, the idea, like you said, VOD was so important and you had these, you know, kind of uh, ambitious goals set up for how much content we're going to have available to people who are subscribing. Um, and then as the network continued to go on and as the product continued to go, I feel like it became more, at least from a company perspective, more obvious that the things that were driving people to the network were going to be the current product we're going to be live events going to be pay-per-views going to be wrestlemania do you feel like the vow the um vod was was kind of put on the wayside or at least re rendered a secondary goal because or a, thir or, or a third goal because um it, the as the network kind of matured it became kind of clear at least to executives that the goal that the actual driving revenue of the network is always going to be our current product and not all of this stuff in the past uh i would think yeah for sure uh i i think that there there are certainly some folks there a lot of those folks again like i said are pretty much all gone now so i'm not disparaging anybody or throwing anybody under the bus it's just there was there were some people there that 
I, I don't think understood as much uh, about, you know, which again, to, to somebody like myself and others who were like me, who know the importance of the history of this business and, 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 uh, you know, give our blood, sweat and tears for it. And, you know, embrace it and know how important that was to where we are today uh, to have that kind of poo-pooed from folks that I feel like, regardless whether they were in positions of power or not, that I felt like, you know, maybe not all of them understood the business, you know, and maybe didn't, didn't know anything before 1990-ish, you know, something like that, and, you know, that we're calling some of the shots. So I think that certainly had a part in it, you know, just to give you an example, like I said, we were, we were 250 plus hours uh, per month at, at our peak. Uh, when I was let go, I think we were barely holding on to 20 hours per month for VOD. So that's, that's kind of where, where, where it ended up. Uh, even though it's, you know, the, we have a giant platform there that, you know, that we dump hundreds and thousands of hours into, um, there's still, there's still that much left in the, in the tank, in, 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 in the, in the library, you know, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I think that's certainly the case, you know, certainly it was more, and then they, you know, they started doing more of those types of things with the current talent, you know, like your, your, your ride alongs and your table for three and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, the bump, you know, that, that kind of stuff, you know, was, was, you know, they incorporated more of the current talent and, and emphasized that for sure. So, yeah, I think you, again, you hit it on the head on that one. Were you involved in any of the acquisitions involving like, uh, current, uh, existing independent wrestling talent? We, we know that, um, you know, they had evolved programming. They had, I think West side yep. extreme wrestling in Germany from there. I, yep. I want to say progress was also involved. Were yep. you involved in any of that? And ICW. Insane championship yep. wrestling. Yep, I was. I was the guy. I was the point guy for it. Yep. Um, so again, talk to me about that because I'm really interested in knowing. Like, were you surprised? Were you given a directive to, to open negotiations with these people? Like, what would, that that was kind of a, a very atypical move by WWE to to kind of work with active groups to promote to essentially promote their business. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I think it was an opportunity. I think it was a win win. Uh, that's how I looked at it because it was a win for us because we we gained more programming probably for a, a discounted price. And, you know, we didn't have to buy the library, you know, it was just in, uh, some, some sort of con contract. And again, that wasn't something that I negotiated. I, that was not me. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm just a TV guy. You know, I, I don't, I don't negotiate contracts. Um, but yeah, that, again, that was another hat that I wore was the independent wrestling promotion guy, you know, basically anything that went near or touched VOD, I had to be involved with it in some way, shape or form. So it, like I said, a win-win was we got the discount, we got the footage. And then these these folks who were struggling to find a wide platform for their product, holy cow, they got to be they get to be on WWE Network now. I mean, it took us some years to actually get it up, you know, because there was you know some there was there was different levels that they, they wanted to make different levels of the network and make it a different t I'm sorry tier. So they wanted they, they went through many different a couple of years worth of how these tiers were going to look and where the indie product was going to go. And, and that was going to be, you know, X amount more dollars per month, you know, if, if you wanted that and those kinds of things. So it just took a lot to get it up because I worked with it uh, pretty much from the time we started uh, in business with these folks, which was probably, I want to say 17, maybe 18, something like that. You know, so we, so, we were. So honestly, I was listening to a, a talk from George Barrios, who is probably the co-president at the time, and yep. he just sort of brought up, just without prompting. Oh yeah, we and we have pro deals with Progress and ICW. I, I think remember it was that. Yeah, yeah. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, that was really surprising to to yeah, me. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that happening. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so it's, so we'll call it twenty seventeen. So, you know, and then when I let you know again when I was I was, I I was let go in twenty twenty, and. At that time, again, I, I worked on those shows. I, it, that was exclusively me. Like I was the only one that worked on those shows, unless they got overwhelmed, all overwhelming, and there was too many. I would I would have, have some help, but those were basically just all me. So they would they would send in, I don't know, half dozen or so, six or eight, ten maybe at a time, 
uh, of their 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 weekly show as well as some of their as well as all of their pay-per-views you know like you hit them all on the head you know evolve icw insane championship wrestling which is uh over in the uk uh progress scotland, yeah. yeah scotland of progress also in the uk that's more of an english brand and then uh wxw which was the german folks that you, that you mentioned uh which is kind of where today's you know uh i guess gunther he's called nowadays was was kind of a big star over there yeah um, got june 2017 is look, looks like the timing for that there you comment go. from Good. Marios. yeah just to update everybody there i knew we kept that dude around here for a reason um but nonetheless uh all of those i i miss i mean i i probably did hundreds of those shows and like i said when i was let go they still hadn't made air yet i don't believe i i think they or they might have been just starting or they might have started when the pandemic hit because we figured what the hell we need programming why don't we just use it now you know and again a lot of that stuff most of that stuff was uh i had to check through every show that came in so again similar to the other shows but not as bad because we were obviously living in the late 2000s uh go through all the music right go through all the mm -hmm. music what was the music where did it come from who they, they some of them had their own compose you know they had their own composers and stuff so that was fishy you had to kind of like look into that all from a legal standpoint uh every now and then they try to roll out a uh uh you know um a, a, a real piece they try to slide one through you know obviously that we had to put a stop to uh those kinds of things but all those shows their audio was always all over the place so that was tricky you know, we had to deal with that a lot and by that i mean it was either way too freaking low or way way too high um and and yeah and i just i so i would do that you know those are pretty much weekly every other week or so maybe so i did yeah all of those those four libraries for sure everything that they sent to our company uh went through me and I got to know a lot of that. That I, I I really studied those guys, and I got to know a lot of. It. So that's why when I you see when I see them nowadays, you know, I'm like, man, you know, back then, I was probably the only one that ever knew who that dude actually was, you know, or whatever. Were you um? And that kind of helped out the UK. You know, had that spinoff for our for the UK, NXT NXT right? UK. Right. So that was similar to a lot of those guys work there now you know so were you um were you given like a directive like when the indie company content started coming in were you told like we're doing this or just for we need we, this will be good good additions to our video library we'll have um you know matches of guys who are on our show now obviously nxt uk guys a lot of them start you know we're in progress and other european promotions mm -hmm. um were you, were you given kind of a directive like were you like this is why we're you're suddenly now doing all of this work with all these um independent companies and these european companies um not necessarily i don't remember that being a thing um i think it was just like providing us with more footage and providing them a platform a bigger platform so they could so they could um get exposure and i i mean obviously i think there was a point where we probably saw a future for us to use it in some capacity and probably wanted to have like an inside track on deals with talent that they felt were worthwhile to come over. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I think that's got to be an assumption, but I, I was never told that or given that directive. No. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. So there's, yeah. The, so the ICW was Fight Club, and then Progress. I don't I, know. I, pull, I pulled up the network on. on the yeah, I don't know if here. Progress had a name. I don't remember that. Uh, is this the, this is Peacock? You mean not this the is network? The, the Peacock, yes. Peacock. Well, the network on on Peacock, yes. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was wondering if I could ask you about some of the, I guess the more pro prominent wrestling. Oh, you know what progress was? Progress was chapters. That's right. So it was like progress chapter one fifteen, progress chapter one sixteen. That's how they did their business. Those are the every every day show or the weekly shows, whatever they were. Yeah, I, I would like to get into some of the libraries that are pretty prominent to me in wrestling history, especially the territory era, sure. but are not so much, they're, they're certainly not on the network. And one of, one of them that comes to mind is, I, you know, I, th I think you said that this was wrapped up in the, in the Jim Crocker promotions uh, acquisition. So like Georgia, there's yep. no Georgia championship wrestling on the network, as far as I know. 
Yeah. So what do you think the story is with that? Or do you know why, why, has, why is none of that content yeah. out there? I, I can tell you 100%. Uh, so what's tricky with Georgia was um, we weren't able to – the original – and again, this could be this could be wrestling folklore for all I know. But the original Georgia Championship Wrestling, the original assets, we would never were able to get our hands on for whatever reason. What we heard was, once again, take this with a grain of salt, what we heard was that Ole Anderson, who was the promoter at the time, before they were kind of bought out by Crockett, I, I believe is the way it went down, um, was so crazed and so angry that these were going to be purchased and then somehow into our hands at some point um, because he was a big anti vince anti wwe guy um he still never did business with us at all like even when we did the horseman stuff even when we did you know flair stuff that we really needed him or didn't Mm -hmm. really i mean screw him if he didn't want to do it he didn't want to do it but like he still held that grudge to this day yeah. Um, but we, what we had heard was he took all the original Georgia championship wrestling tapes, took them around back of, of an empty arena and set them on fire. That's, that's the story that we got. And I, again, you can take that with a grain of salt and, and, and do it with, with, with what you will. But the, the point is that the, the Georgia footage that we ended up getting, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier that I, that I was able to find, or one of us was able to find on the back end of some of these old, like. I don't think it was a mid-Atlantic reels. It was, although it might have been, uh, or it was old, um, you know, the old WCW shows pre prior to Saturday night. Uh, they were on the back of all of those, all of these reels, like weird out of nowhere, but they were clearly recorded off of a, off of a DVD, right? You could see the DVD start, you know, yeah. hard piece, and then you could see it finish, right? You knew that's what happened. And a lot of times the footage was garbage, you know, I mean, unairable, you know, just so poor that you would do yourself a disservice. I would do the fans a disservice if I wanted to air it, you know, and I would certainly I would I would get fired, you know, because it, it just so that's your answer for Georgia. Georgia just there's not a lot of it. There's I think we have, a, a you know, you, you would probably have enough episodes if you wanted to run a few in a consecutive. But they're so they're so hit and miss. And the footage is so poor and the audio is so poor that it's hard. It's, it, I, we, we've used it in the past. I don't think we've ever aired an episode. I think we've used it. I know I have for yeah. for B-roll, you know, right. and for those of you that don't know B-roll, that's just like miscellaneous shots over, like if somebody's speaking or whatever that might be. And that I definitely used it on that because I can th- see a Tony Atlas shot from Georgia that I definitely used in an old Legends of Wrestling show. Uh, yeah. So that's your answer for Georgia. The other one that that I that, that I that I would fit in that category uh, that I was I was part of purchasing certainly uh, is is CWF the old Florida stuff. Florida, yeah. So we, we did that, and that was a two 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 fold situation because that was that was dual owned, dual owned. So one 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 chunk of the library was owned by the Grams. Eddie Graham was the original promoter down there. Mike Graham was in charge when we were there. Um, and then there was another later chunk of the library that was, uh, taken over by Steve Kern. So Steve Kern worked like later in time, like yeah, later in time, later in time. Yeah. So Mike, Mike, Mike had all the, all the really, really good stuff, you know, for guys like me who just would like sit back and watch for hours. Right. It was all the stuff, you know, the, the 1970s dusty, you know, all the stuff that that, that was. And this is Gordon Soli. Gordon doing the host hosting, like standing up and pitching the stuff and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, and Kearns, Kearns, so Kearns ended up being like eighties and nineties, you know, late, uh, not that it wasn't quality stuff. It was, it just didn't have the, the, the allure that the, that the Graham stuff had it, it, that stuff. I, I always tried to figure out how to get it aired because it was so good. Um, it, it they just, they came in pieces if, 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 to, to, for lack of a better term. Uh, they weren't well put together, like you, like we just said. There was a lot of Gordon and just like pitching his stuff, and then he would go in a different direction. And it was, it was, it was, you know, footage from another spot or another time. And again, a lot. Sometimes there was those handshake agreements where we'd have to pull footage out because you know, we didn't have rights to it. And 
and but those were such good quality they just didn't have a good co cohesive uh, versions of the shows which i thought was a shame because we were able to put together a nice series of them for classics but that's because we used we that's because we used mike graham as as a host and that's what we did with a lot of that stuff which is a point that i want to bring up earlier we did with a lot of that stuff on classics is you know we used guys or or gals who were relevant you know and that was my thing which i thought was most important to the audience was we used people who were relevant to the product you know i never ever in my life wanted to have to use michael cole to host a history of ecw show like i was never going to do that ever because that was just not something i could bring myself to do not nothing against michael i like michael we've always been friends um, but Taz was a no-brainer, right? Because here, here you got a guy who lived it. Who, who better would I want to host a show than somebody who lived it? So that's why we used him for that. We used Mike Graham for the CWF shows. We used Michael Hayes and Kevin Von Eric for the WCCW stuff. You know, that was, uh, you know, we used Gene for Hall of Fame because who better to host Hall of Fame than me and Gene? You know, so that, that those were kind of things that we did to try to make the product as great quality as we could. I'm sorry I got off on a completely different tangent there but but yeah the CWF is unfortunate I, I wish we could have found a better way uh the other the only the other one is Stampede Stampede was always yep. tricky uh and some I, of it I, appeared on the network for a time and then then it suddenly it disappeared yeah because it became a Brett issue it's always kind of a Brett issue so usually Brett has some sort of legal say in the stuff so mm -hmm. sometimes we we again I go with the we WWE um thinks that they got everything square with brett and then it's not square with brett so that's why that stuff happens with and, and the issue is that he owns the rights to his own matches correct correct and i don't know why we wouldn't air other ones i don't know why that never became a thing because i was in charge of programming most of the time uh, did you know like how he got rights to that or was was the stampy library sold to WWE, but not the brett matches uh, is that how it worked I think that's how it worked. Yeah, I mean, because I certainly was there for Stampede too. I mean, I was there with that purchase. I met with um, his brothers. So there was um, Ross and, with the... and oh, um, Ross and Bruce. They were the guys who were running the library purchase. And so, so would that have been before the Brett DVD came out? I think in like 2005 yes. or something. I, and I can imagine him being so. more yes. protective and afraid. So, that... so thank you, thank you for bringing that up, Brandon. So that's 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 exactly correct. So when it was time for the brett dvd then we had to get into a negotiation with brett that's how that went down so then he signed off on rights for x amount of footage or footage for that i guess and then somehow i think we thought it meant somehow there was confusion that maybe he signed off on all of it and that's why some of it started to air and then that was not the case again i'm, I'm picking at details that i don't know exactly the facts that's just what, what I what we heard and what, what kind of the rumors were. But there's plenty of, you know, there's other shows out there. You know, certainly I did a run of them on classics. You know, there's plenty of them on classics or were on classics. Um, you know, so I, I'm, it's, it's, it's you got me thinking now because I'm not sure why I never went back to that. I think people just thought because of that situation that Stampede, Stampede became such a headache that nobody wanted to, to deal with approving it so it just kind of got left behind i think because i loved i i was a big fan of their library so i why there had to be a reason why i i didn't at least pitch it a couple times because i i used to do the the schedule the entire 12 month schedule for the network for 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 everything vod so everything that came out every month i was the one that was um scheduling that i would schedule them years and every august i would go and schedule the next full 12 months and get it approved so somebody must have along the way said hey you know can we stay away from the stampede stuff that must have happened at some point i just can't remember that 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 when that was and i probably just never revisited it for whatever reason you talked about this um before you're no longer with the company and you're talking about kind of some what i would consider almost like lost stuff at this point like you know the stampede stuff exists but it's not on there you know some of the florida stuff exists but it's not on there do you have any optimism that we will see any of this stuff um ever uploaded it seems like the philosophy behind what they're interested in putting on their um streaming services has changed but do you have any idea like i'm thinking that eventually fans will be able to see some of this stuff yeah, yeah like just... I, and look i don't want to paint the paint the picture the wrong way like there wasn't like anybody saying that cwf couldn't air or anybody said that you know the the 
again, there was some bread stuff, but I, I don't think there was anything necessarily blocking that stuff from airing. It just, it was, it's difficult to put it together to air, I guess is, is the answer. Uh, so no, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm, I'm just saying, I, you know, most of the time it was more of a difficulty, a difficulty putting it together than there was any, um, anybody saying that they wanted to go in a different direction or were preventing us from putting anything up. You know, that wasn't necessarily the case at all. I don't want to make that clear. Um, but do I have hope? Uh, I don't know. You know, at this stage of the game, it's, it, and from what I do know, because um, there is a former colleague of mine and, and, a, and a, you know, a, a close friend that, that is still there that is, has, that stuff kind of ended up in his lap. Um, and from the last time I spoke with him, you know, you know, a couple of months back, um, about that kind of thing, he said it was, you know, it was still a thing. It was still going, but it's, it's basically an afterthought at this point, you know, so he just kind of does it, puts it up and kind of nobody says anything. Since since the Peacock era, I don't think so. Everything, almost everything has made it over to Peacock for us viewers, but I don't think they've added anything. I, I know there's some WF superstars episodes i believe that have been added but as far as like older territorial stuff that's part of libraries that were acquired i don't think any of that has been it's added. very small but 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 to be fair you know a lot of the stuff like i tried like i think i mentioned earlier you know that a lot of those territorial libraries are you know for the most part complete like world class is complete you know mm-hmm. mid-self proper is complete you know um the the other there's another you know there, there's another mid-self show that we, uh I think of it off the top of my head. Um, there was another weekly mid sell show that was that we didn't bother going down that road because it was it was too legally difficult to get around because the music was too much and 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 we just couldn't get it out. So, but but and, and let me clarify. So the mid sell library. From what we acquired, what WWE acquired, like, are there missing episodes? Absolutely, there's missing episodes. But that that wasn't that wasn't our fault. We put up every episode that was given to us in in the purchase from the Watts family. You know, whatever they gave us, we put up. World class is the same. Some of the episodes were damaged. Some of the episodes are missing. One hundred percent. But like the weekly WCCW show. All of those episodes that are owned by WWE are on the air. There's nothing that was left behind. That library, in our view, what what I used to, another thing that people were really interested in at that time was, okay, well, give me the news when the library is complete. That's what we want to hear now. We want to hear this library is complete, this library is complete, this library is complete. So that was kind of my thing for a while, for a good running year or so, was make sure we tell everybody when we complete the libraries. So in our view, like I said, I, and there's more, you know, ECW is complete. Uh, certainly WCW is not because there's so many facets of it. But like Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, that's complete. Um, like, uh, I'm trying to think uh, of what else. Uh, let me see. I got some notes here. Uh, there's a little bit of Smoky Mountain on there. Yep. Uh, i trying to think. But those are those are complete. Those libraries are complete in in, in ours. Smoky Mountain was was I'll get to that in a second. You know, and, and I say that because and a lot of times, you know, sometimes like you you were saying earlier, I think uh, about the tape uh, tape exchanges back in the day. Right. Old old school style. Mm-hmm. Uh, we That was done often. You know, if, if we thought something was really important and we didn't have access to it, uh, there was, you know, guys on our staff that were very, very um, good at that kind of thing that, that would go out there. You so know, you're saying if you did, didn't have the master of a, of a given true, episode. True. And we thought it was important enough. Now, we didn't do it on every episode because that would be a waste of money. So we did it on episodes or, or, or certain instances that we thought were super, super important. And we thought we have to have this as part of this package or this library or this the story that we're telling here. Uh, we certainly had access or knew how to get access to folks online that would have said masters and then into i mean we did it we did it kind of on 
you know, it was a kayfabe situation. We certainly didn't tell them we were WWE knocking on their door. You know, <laughs> uh, we we just told them we were miscellaneous, like whoever the, whoever was doing it was doing yeah. it, and and, and you know, we did that about a million times. I mean, that you know, all those all those old East, which which now are also complete the ECW super shows. You know, which I had a party. That was kind of one of the last things I think I I, I was hit, hit, you know very involved in. Those were all purchased uh, online. We had none of. We Paul never gave us any of those, so those were all online purchases and redone. You know, so those those you know those are tricky too because you don't have any audio to, to mess around with. You have to figure it all out. You know, because it's it's kind of a complete master. It's not it's not. Yeah stuff that we can work you know it was, it was difficult to work with let's put it that way and what do you do if there's a new jack match where, where they're playing natural born killers through the whole match uh, <laughs> I, I wish i had i wish i had i wish i had my editor uh my editor friend on this call he could tell you a story or two about that because him and i worked deep into nights doing new jack matches just just new jack <laughs> matches only I, i'm not i, I kid you not I, and you laugh but yeah. but I'm telling you, Brandon, it, it wasn't funny. It was painful, but absolutely. So what we had to do was, um, and, and we got it down after a while, you know, after you did five of them, you know, you didn't have to worry about it as much anymore. You know, we would have, we would have to go through, we, we, we picked out a new, you know, I picked out a new piece of music, which was one of my all time favorites. Um, and every single thing, you know, that was, again, that was one of those lucky, lucky occasions for the most part that we had Joey Styles on a clean channel. So we had the commentary. If you have the commentary, the rest is basically cake except for New Jack. So when we got into those matches, you would have to, you know, we knew we had Joey, so we were good, but you had to take, um, you know, we ended up uh, just combing through his sound effects machine, you know, he, all our audio editors, right, have sound effect. They have thousands of sound effects, right, that they could that we could choose from. So we would find one and we would label it toaster, and we would find one and labeled it uh, keyboard, you know, and we'd find one and label it uh, broomstick, you know. Or, you know or the, we would find one and we would label it uh, computer monitor, you know, or you know, whatever you know, toaster oven, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, mop, you know, can, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and then we would just use those all throughout and, and, and rebuilding those matches. No lie. Just those matches alone would take longer than it would take us to rebuild the entire pay-per-view. You know, it was that, it was that wow. difficult. And, and it was, it was a, it was an adventure, but uh, you know, every one of those new Jack matches is on there. You know, we never lost any of them, which is uh, again, something I'm real, real proud of. You know, we, we, we tried to keep the integrity as best we could. So those those were certain. I'm, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because that was a, that was a memory that I hadn't thought of in a while. So, speaking of editing, anyone that ever had WWE Network knows that if they were to type in Benoit in the search bar, nothing would come up. Right. What was it like dealing with that kind of content? Because uh, to my knowledge, I can't think of any ma like Chris Benoit matches not existing on the on the network. But it does seem like. Obviously, there was a directive to not promote him in any way, shape, or form, right? Uh, in any way on the network, you know. I'm sure he's not in any thumbnails. I'm sure he's no. not. He's not in any like match listings. He's the, the content is there, but you have to find it yourself. Yeah. Um, what was was that? Did that require specific editing on your end? And I'm also curious to know if there's anybody else who was given that directive, or is it an issue solely related to Chris Benoit? Um. So. Yes, certainly that was a major, major directive, uh, uh, especially pre-network. So pre-network, uh, for, for uh, classics, uh, he was a no-go. He was a no-go. Matches were removed. Um, there was no mention, mentions of him were removed. Um, graphics of him were removed. Uh, he was an absolute, and that was, a, you know, that was a tough, tough get too, because that was similar to, you know, your what we spoke of earlier with your blurring the WWF logo. You know, it's the same kind of thing. You know, um, and you would have to make notes of it. You would have to make notes. You know, uh, in the notes they would say, you know, uh, scratch logo, uh, massive cursing, Benoit. You know, that would have to be noted. It would have to be noted. You know, every time. Um, and that was, I guess, more when we got to network because that then he was allowed. Right, he was allowed. 
because we didn't want to we didn't want to lose any integrity of any shows and, and you know and i guess you know he did a lot of good wrestling let's be honest right i mean he did um so i think things changed i think legally it changed i think feelings changed uh again we just followed direction you know i i i don't want to give you information that i don't have because i i don't know you know that's not fair uh that, that was never something that you know i made any calls on i just did what i was told uh, but um so others if i could think for a moment i know that there were um uh certainly like down the line there was uh like i think one i can remember that came in the last five or so years 10 years whatever it might have been was certainly um was buck rock and roll zoom off if you guys know the story about that dude um it's not a good one so he did a lot of really bad things uh, to a, a lot of really young women so uh he was certainly then on the list um he would have been in awa yes somewhat yeah yeah and but but the other the tricky part was he he jobbed for us a lot okay that nobody knew in the 90s uh on like superstars mm. right because you have such this massive library and you never know where the guy's like, gonna go up, right? the, especially if it's someone who you never thought of before right like, right and, and, and oh it. no it's I right. remember if, seeing all that Buck Zumoff stuff here and there. It's, if you're not a wrestling guy, you know, if you're not a wrestling guy like, you know, we are, you wouldn't know who the hell Buck Rock and Roll Zumoff was, right? So that's, you know, that was a lot of our younger staff had to be taught that, you know. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was others. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure there was definitely a handful, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. But if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up, late, late, you know, if we're still on the call here. And if, if I'm looking at this uh, Wikipedia page that that's called W Libraries, and they, they say that within that is IWA Puerto Rico. Yes, uh, I forgot about that one. Yep. And so that is something that that W owns. Absolutely. So that one uh, was definitely there when I when I was there. I used I I went through all of it because again one of my jobs was to comb through the stuff and make sure everything was legal legal to air right. So I did a lot of that. It took the guys a lot, long, long time to get because there was a lot of it, and at that time we were, you know, we weren't, we were all tapeless at that point. So it takes the guys a long time to ingest large, what we call ingest large chunks of footage. It just takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So it, I wanted to air it. I'm, I want to say uh, 2019, if not 2020, right before the pandemic. I think I was going to air it in some sort of a, it might have been, it might have been late 2019. Um, I wanted to air it in like Spanish Heritage Month, you know, like it, it, it's like a combo of September, November, September, October or October, November in that area. And um, I, 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 I don't remember why I think, I, I, I don't know if it was, a, maybe it was an approval thing or we couldn't find enough full episodes that were good enough to air without so much problematic music that it would have taken us weeks to, to turn it around. Uh, I think that was, was what I remember. Uh, but yeah, I combed through a lot of it. That was a, that was a library that we definitely had on our radar for a long, long time because so many guys wrestle for, for, for Carlos Cologne. I mean, um, you know, who was the owner and promoter. Uh, and, and this so is listing 99 to 2001. Is, is that, do you know if that's accurate? That's, is, that's, is it, obviously, obviously, I Puerto Rico is this is long before and that, that after is, that. That that is inaccurate. Okay, that is inaccurate. It looks like it's just listing the developmental. Yeah, that's not accurate. Here. That's yeah, that's not accurate. Yeah, uh, it's the whole thing. It's all of it because I saw okay. I saw footage from, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, their, their music situation was 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 dreadful. So yeah, I know that was an issue. Uh, and it was harder because it was outdoors a lot, you know, so um, they aired a lot of this stuff from Roberto Clemente Stadium down there. So that was difficult um, to match the audio and, and the music and things of that nature. You know, to an outdoor crowd, to indoor crowd is a lot different. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a library that WWE does own. I did not have a part in that one. I, I, I don't remember why. I, I think it just kind of came up and then I heard about it next. It was it was it was in the in the can. So I, I don't know why I, I didn't. But I, 
yeah, to you to your to, the answer is yes it's definitely wwe owned and were there libraries that you tried to purchase that were you, you weren't unable to or the con you you just reviewed and the quality and content yep. wasn't worth what they were asking for absolutely yep one one that i can that stands out to me is um uh do i know the name of it off the top of my head that's the challenge uh it was owned by dick the bruiser if iwa guys, in indianapolis sounds exactly i was going to say iwa i'm not lying. he ran like an outlaw yeah like yep. promotion uh yeah it was it was like a a lot of it was AWA spinoff, right? A yeah. lot of it was AWA guys. So, um, so Dick the Bruiser, uh, we went to Indy, uh, same, same, it was always me and, and another uh, colleague of mine. Um, and it was good. It was okay. Uh, you know, it's just like some of the talent wasn't great. And uh, I want to say the quality was decent. I don't remember it being poor. Um, I know it was in a nice storage facility, so you know some of these things were not. So th that was a major issue on some of them. Uh, but it was run by his wife, you know, because he had passed away. Um, so uh, I think the asking price was too high for the for what we viewed the quality of of the purchase was. Uh, I believe that was. I don't think there was enough a, a B talent there that was worth you know a million dollars if that's what he was asking. And I just made that up. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But I, I know that it was. I believe that that was the conclusion. It was not worth the. It was not worth the price. Um, I mean, we certainly spent a few days down there and certainly come through a lot of it. Uh, but I think that was it. And like I said, I don't recall it being a, a quality issue. Uh, but like for instance, you know, to that point, like, you know, the the the, the von Erichs, You know, the library. On one hand, the 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 tapes, the regular show. You know, and and, and we got multiple shows from him. You know, there was another thing called Texas Wrestling which was prior to WCCW. So they, there's that, some of those episodes are around. I don't think there was a full library to air. And then there was another one that was, um, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. So the Texas wrestling was way, way back. That was like in the, in the, in, in the more of the Fritz era, um, you know, so fifties and sixties, and that was all film. Um, and w w there's definitely been clips of that of air here and there. Uh, but those again those are difficult to put together because they're only like one or two matches it's never like a full show um, and those were awesome and great quality and um, they were just um, the tapes themselves right for the regular world-class show were stored were stored wonderfully they're in a storage facility you know cooling you know the right temperature the <laughs> the film footage and a lot of this texas wrestling stuff <laughs> was uh, uh, and, and Kevin is a good friend, Kevin Von Erich, uh, he, he stored them on, on the Von Erich ranch in, 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 in a barn in, in the backyard. So you imagine how some of the quality of those tapes were, those film reels were, you know, what happened to some of those films reels when they opened them, they turned into soot is what happened. So, you know, we lost a lot of those, you know, which was unfortunate, you know, because they just weren't stored properly. I mean, yeah, and that was older footage. Yeah, film canisters that like were just the eighties footage. Like I'm talking about when we got them back there, we had guys in hazmat suits opening them up because they the the, the smell was so raunchy. It just was hard to even be around them because you know they were stored in a hundred and fifty degree barn for twenty years, you know, or whatever long it was, you know. So those sometimes those things didn't work out. Thankfully, we were able to save some of them. You know, like I said, this there's, there's probably at least thirty or forty of those reels that are that are good, um, and that's just my it's a guess. Um, there was a couple others that we just couldn't, we never went to see and, and review. I don't think it, it just, it got to a point where it was non-negotiable anymore, just because I think obviously there was a pricing issue. And I think that was, I think that happened. Um, I think that happened with, with, the, with the Paul Bosch group down in Houston. Mm -hmm. Which That's is like a famous by, missing. That's yeah. a famous missing Billy library. Corgan now owns those rights, I believe. I mean, we had, they had it. They, we, we just, we, uh, uh, yeah, missing is not the right word, but a famously oh, uh, uh, there, there, there was, it was, it was negotiated with for quite a while. I had a buddy that was involved in it, you know, and uh, I think they just couldn't come to the right asking price. So they never sent us out there. That's, that's what I believe. And, and, and some of it came over with Watts. So we do, we, we I'm sorry with the we stuff. I'm just so you did work there a long time. Uh, the WWE has, um, some Houston wrestling because it came Watts and he had an agreement. And again, somehow this part of this agreement was actually legal. I don't know how it was, but it was so, uh, cause they did a lot of, um, 
they did a lot of swapping and they did a lot of uh, uh, watts did a lot of shows in houston with bosch with like a co-promotion kind of thing so there's some of that does exist in wwe and then like uh we, we did some stuff with, with like with portland i think um uh, we, we definitely did an, did a negotiation for the piper dvd you know because that's where roddy started and we got we got rights to the roddy footage from portland and then i think there was a deal on the table and somehow it got scrapped i, I don't remember what happened to that and then there was certainly talk over the years um with the labels you know without in la uh, because that was a lot of good stuff with, with you know, Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens and, you know, a lot of the type of stuff happened out there in San Francisco and L.A. and that kind of thing. And I, I, I don't know why that never happened. You know, I, again, I think there was a pricing issue, but this is just me speculating. And then there was a lot of other ones that were on the list. Like there was a master list at one point with all the libraries that were out there. Some of them I didn't really even know uh, or know about. So um, certainly, you know, there was certainly some more up in Canada. You know that were they were talked about from time to time with like the Rougeos and yeah. I was going to ask about Grand Prix. I feel like I remember yeah. WWE Grand purchasing Prix Grand Prix. On, well, Grand Prix was on the radar for a lot of years, and again, I, I don't know. I, I I don't have the answer. I, I don't know why it was. It would have been nice. It would have added us, you know, something another you know territory to deal with, which is all because that would have a lot of a a like a a level content. Like you'd have a ton of Andre stuff. Yeah, well, that, without a question, you know, and I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I know it was talked about probably for a decade, and then never, nothing happened. I don't know. You know, like I said, that was kind of out of my realm. I didn't have anything to do with it. I just had to do was the guy that went there and made sure it was good. And I want to ask you about one of the tape libraries that I hear, you know, territorial wrestling fans talk about a lot is sort of the revolutionary era of, of, of TV wrestling. And I think it's pretty fragmented as far as the ownership goes, but and that's the Memphis tape library, uh, particularly throughout the eighties. Yep. hundred percent. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we did get, um, there was a separate, I forgot about this too. There was a separate purchase, um, of USWA, not the Lawler version the Jerry Jarrett version. So WWE owns that. Owns so is, is that global? Is that what people mean when they say global? Global is part of that too. Yes. There was a couple different shows. Global was one. And then like just the U U US USWA excitement or something. I forget what the name of the show was, but there was that because we've aired those before. Those definitely have seen the light of day. Yeah. Um, Cause Booker T, you know, the, 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 those guys came from there, you know, Booker T and, and Stevie, right. That's where they started. So we used that we've used that before for those guys um, before they were Harlem Heat. Um, so that does exist, um, and that was basically what that was. Is that is when when Fritz went out of business, Jarrett Jarrett took over the territory basically and made it USWA. Um, they had a match at the end uh, that was like. <clears throat> World class versus USWA. You know that was like the last world class match that Super ever happened. Flash. It, it the last match that ever happened, right? And and they they had, um, uh, boy, I should remember this too. The USWA prevailed, right? So they they became USWA. They were wrestling right out of the Sportatorium in Dallas, like World Class was, but it was a different organization. Um, but the Memphis was always. <clears throat> Memphis was always, always, always talked about. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, a lot of it was owned by Jerry, the King Lawler, and he was, you know, a loyal employee of WWE for a hundred years now, that we couldn't make that negotiation happen always blew my mind. I just, I could never figure it out. You know, uh, you know, we, we got to, he certainly let us use it from time to time. Uh, but the, the full purchase just never came to fruition. He was always weird about it. Uh, and does he own it, or because some, my, my, that, that, the impression, that, sorry, the impression that, I have, the impression I have is that Memphis, the Memphis promotion went through went through various different entities yeah. and di different owners over time. So you, I think it's you are you are absolutely correct. So what happened was, I think that was a big stick in the negotiation because he was, really owns it. Yeah, exactly. So he would say, oh, yeah, 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 all this is mine. And then upon further review, it was like three different guys. 
you know, it wasn't all his at all, you know. So uh, thank you for jogging my memory. That's exactly what it was. It was owned by several. I think Jarrett was still one of them. Um, but there was certainly a couple other guys that were involved over the years that that's why we could never make that happen because there were so many different moving parts that it was just not doable. And, and, and you know, half the time, like I said, the King was, you know, given on the up and up and half the time he wasn't. So that was hard to figure that out. Yeah. And I want to, it comes, it comes to mind, like when, um, in March, Tony Khan acquired ring of honor. Yep. Um, are, are you aware of like, any, negotiations or pursuit that we had of, of the ring of honor library or any kind of licensing of, of their their tapes i got to imagine that that was on the table but that again i, I can't speak to it because it was after me okay. so I, I don't know like that i don't remember that ever being a thing like when i was there because they were they were up and fully active at that point you know they were they were doing their own thing they were pretty damn successful at that point uh so like that was i don't i i, I guess it was always talk that why well, wouldn't that be great if we had if we get in some deal with the ring of honor like anybody would want to do that because we had most of the guys on the roster so yeah I, I would imagine so but i don't remember that being like oh we're getting close we're going to make a deal you know, like that that never was a thing as far as i knew you've touched on this a lot um throughout the podcast kind of talking about what it was like working for wwe how would you describe the work environment of WWE as, as an employee there for a long period of time? Um, if it changed over time or if it was always kind of the same kind of you just, you, the way you describe it is kind of like inconsistent, out of control. There is this, the goals, then the goals move and then you change what your operations are going to be and what you're supposed to be focusing on. There's new directives. How would you describe the, just the overall nature of working at WWE? I mean, you know, it, it, you know, the, Look, every company has has certain quirks and, and ups and downs and things of that nature. It's it, it, it just part of being a, a you know a billion dollar organization. I I would imagine. Um, it just kind of it, it's hard to say. You know, you just it, it it was you know sure at times it was frustrating. Sure at times it was difficult. But you know you went there and you did your job. You know, and you did your job to the best of your ability. And, you know, if directives change, directive change, you know, if you put in a lot of work and it was, you know, ended up going in a different direction. Hey, listen, you know, that that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of the way, way, way it was, you know, a way it is, I guess. I mean, you just had to adapt and you had to roll with the punches, but, but at the end of the day, you had to do your job to the best of your, you know, like I said, to the best of your ability and, and, you know, put the, put the other, you know, nonsense aside and, and, and just work hard you know it, you had to do yeah it was certainly a lot of ups and downs and certainly a lot of all over the place kind of stuff i mean anybody who tells you that that's not the case is is not telling the truth so um yeah certainly i, th I think that's an accurate painting did you work with like closely with Vince at all? I know that you probably maybe when you were with you know more the television or commentary side of things. Did you work yeah. with him? Like no, rarely, rarely. I mean, okay. uh, him, he, I mean, he certainly would. You know, uh, you know, I guess say hello from time to time. But like, I had very little interaction with with Vince. Mm -hmm. So who would you say is like you, was over your time, especially when you're working with the network and things like that? Were you overseeing? Who was you like your direct supervisor? um i well i get why is that relevant oh no i'm just curious um i i, I if you don't mind i'd rather not name okay. any no that's no it's totally it's totally up, up to you i, I mean I, I would i would love to but I, I i think it's probably my best interest to not do that understood um what do you think about wwe's content um now it seems like they have more of a cable presence now where some of this work that maybe you would have used to see on the network and maybe projects that you worked on for the network are now getting deals like the a and e biography series right. and they're doing kind of the post talk show kind of aspects of it what do you make about that like kind of you see the kind of their 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 content is, is spreading beyond just the network and beyond just what might be this niche interest into presumably lucrative cable deals uh look i think it's uh, it's it's great for the for the product i mean it's great for the you know for the company i guess you know i mean um i understand that you know the, the there's a you know there, there's a lot of uh you know similar to what we talked about earlier i, I think there's a lot of more deep standard and practice folks over there as well you know because that's what i've heard uh you know i know the shows have been very difficult and, and a lot of times come back with like i mentioned with the fox folks you know with 
X amount of changes that you just didn't see coming. Um, and I know it's been a long, uh, long process. And I know it's been a lot of hours um, from you know what I heard, what I know. Um, and look, it's it's wonderful. You know, I'm a wrestling guy, like I told you. You know, to see the product get spread about, you know, other, other, you know, viable networks is cool. You know, yeah, it's great. Uh, I love the biography idea. Um, I, you know, even you know, even though it's a weird off the track, you know, not WWE thing. Just like even those dark side of the rings. You know, that's that's you know that's interesting, cool stuff that's, you know, wrestling relevant, I guess, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's really nice. I mean, I, I love to see it get out there. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, a, 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 you know, AEW is doing a bang up job, too. So, you know, it's, it's all good. I'm just waiting for their, them to, to uh, have some kind of a streaming situation. And, you know, I'd love to, you know, I've already, I've already pitched myself out there to be involved in that if that ever happens. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's need great. someone to scrub ROH tapes. And I'm sure there's a lot of ROH stuff. I that, would that imagine are, there is. That the ROH yeah. library has a I lot would, to... Uh, I would imagine because I can't, I, especially, you know, from years past, obviously. So, yeah, I, I'm fascinated that, it, that it's still, you know, that they're that they're doing stuff now, you know, that, that especially now with like Warner Brothers Discovery on board, that, that they're not having them clean that stuff up, you know, as far as the, the blood, and, you know, like blood and guts, the other last week or whenever that was you know that was you know that's pretty you know that was not not 2020 wrestling you know anymore but i but there are there are folks who think that's what it's supposed to be so you know that's that's okay too i'm just i'm just surprised I'll, by it that's all i'll say this about discovery warner their biggest annual thing outside of the nba playoffs is a block of programming that is all about sharks True. And I, I was watching someone showed a listing of a show tonight where it's like, I think it's called Sharks versus Pigs. And it, the theme is that sharks will be essentially eating pigs that are trying to swim away from them. Tremendous. Uh, so I, I, I always, I, it's kind of funny when it's like, oh, I don't know if ta ta Warner is going to be on board with all this blood and guts. I'm like, have you seen some of the stuff that the yeah, other show? Uh, it's a good point. Um, it's a good point. It's but kind I of funny. I, and, and but I wrestling's guess... unique in how its violence is portrayed. But I guess that's what I heard, right? And I'm sure you guys heard this. It was um, that that's why they're doing that shark uh, shark cage gimmick in the next it's, AEW. It's the time, yeah. It's the time. Sponsored by Shark Week. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. I love. Oh my God! Uh, can we can we move on? <laughs> so I wanted to to just kind of ask to wrap things up here on like just your general reflections on the network. I mean, it's a really interesting legacy as far as one of the first kind of OTT services of its kind and then kind of how it's it's, it's legacy shifted from to the point where it's, it's no longer available in the United States at least and it's kind of been enveloped by this peacock thing but what overall like what are your kind of thoughts and reflections on having worked you know on the network for, for pretty much its entire existence and especially those years where it was rumored about and it was supposed to be a a cable channel I believe was the original thought behind it um, just kind of what are your general thoughts on the WWE network as a concept, as an experiment, as a way for the pro the way to present the product and the, these video libraries. What are you, just your general thoughts on that? We were running, uh, we were actually running promos on our classics shows, promoting the network in 2012 and then having to pull them down and pull it off when they said, yeah, that's not happening anymore. You know, so we, 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 we got bitten by that as well. Um, but uh, in general, I mean, I love it. I mean, I, I, I feel like uh, that's a big chunk of my life is there, you know, uh, and, and we worked very hard to, to, to get all those shows up and to clean up all those shows and make them relevant and presentable and enjoyable. And, you know, it, it was, uh, look, the concept is great. I, I, I mean, it changed from time to time. Like I said, the, the back and forth with the linear stuff was, was kind of, you know, you know, a tough bump and then, you know, to have BOD as your star and then not as your star, you know, obviously again, was not my favorite thing that happened. Um, but I guess it just kind of evolved, you know, it, it evolved into, you know, more original programming than not, you know, and, and that's kind of what people, you know, that are making the decisions, I guess, are on board with uh, these days. So that's kind of where it's at. Um, I think it's not available in the United States unless you have Peacock. I think that's unfortunate for some folks because, you know, uh, 
some folks can't get it or some folks aren't willing to do it. You know, I, I would have rather it just stayed. But I mean, again, it's a lucrative deal for the company and, you know, they're going to do that every 10 times out of 10, you know, and, and, and they would be foolish not to, I suppose. Um, I guess, you know, that, you know, if you wanted them to think more about the everyday fan, I guess you could make that argument, but you know, it is still corporate and it is going to be run by corporate folks and, and do best for the bottom line. I mean, any company is going to do that. So, um, I think, you know, I think overall it's been successful. It's certainly had ups and downs, no doubt. Uh, but, uh, you know, I like certainly what, what we were able to accomplish, you know, when, when we were kind of running that whole, whole situation and, and I'm proud of it. And I hope that it just, you know, certainly, gave some some people some joy and some memories and 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 just you know had some fun with it and you know hopefully it continues to you know evolve down, down the road and you know i sure as heck wish i still had a hand in it to be honest i mean definitely i think as a regular as for the from the fan perspective it's it's i think it's now it's taken for granted because all of our content is like this but the, there's just the absolute difference in going from having to tape trade having to download torrents if you could find them, having to hope that they had certain things at the video store or buying DVDs. Um, you know, I used to go to Newberry Comics and buy DVDs yep. because they had the, the rented, um, the used ones. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing and wonderful to be. To it's be, such a difference. To have a part in that and to be, a, a, mm -hmm. in, and I would argue a major part in that. And I'm oh, not yeah. trying to toot my own horn, but I, I'm just trying to be honest. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm proud and, and just to have all of that at your finger, at your fingertips is, is amazing in, in this day and age. And, you know, if, if we only had that, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you would have to search and search and search. Like we actually, I grew up in Boston and we ended up actually getting world-class on like the first syndicated deal that, that, that they ever made. And like, that was a, like, but you had to figure out where it was on your old dial and you know whatever we didn't even have vcrs back then you know i'm old so it was um to have all of this stuff at your fingertips and, and just you know for me to be able to go through all that world-class stuff that i remember as a kid and be able to produce it and give it to other folks and and to like become friends with kevin von eric who like i idolized when i was a kid you know was it's crazy good and you know michael i mean ps i've known my whole life i've known i'm not my whole life my whole career I've known him since I walked in the door at WWE. So, um, you know, that that's stuff is unique and it's cool. And to be, be able to present that out there, at, 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 you know, with thousands of hours and be responsible to, for a majority of it and, and, you know, to give that to, to the audience, to the WWE universe and others is, is, is super cool. So. I was going to say only, only in professional wrestling. Can you, can you say I'm getting on a plane to talk to the widow of a man named Dick the Bruiser? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's a very important business deal working on with the widow of Dick, the, the late Dick the Bruiser. We have the late Dick the Bruiser's wife who has some tapes she's sitting on that are going to cost us a million bucks, but we'll get back to you. All right. Well, um, thanks so much for, for, for participating in this. I think this is a really interesting conversation. I'm happy for Brandon to help put it together. Um, Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Thank you guys yeah. for having me. I appreciate it very much. And Brandon, like I told you in the past, please do not hesitate. You know where I am. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Thanks for being so generous with your time. I think people who are who are big fans of uh all varieties of regional wrestling from back in the day and who grew up as tape traders like i did hopefully they'll, they'll really appreciate this and, and appreciate the work that you've done as well to help us see all this stuff so thanks I hope again so. john i hope so and i thank you uh, thank you you guys very very much and, and i'll look forward to it hopefully i'll get a look at the uh at the finished product sometime cool all right thanks again john all right very good guys take it easy